Hello, and welcome to SoberCast, where we provide AA speaker meetings and workshops in podcast format. We're an ad-free podcast, and if you enjoy listening, please help us be self-supporting by visiting SoberCast.com, look for the donate link, and drop a dollar or two into our virtual basket. We hope you enjoy the podcast. Have a great day. And we have a lot of new people here today, and I'll just briefly mention that preamble is a quick reminder of what this organization is and what everybody is doing here this morning. And I've come to look at it as uh, a very simple fact that we're able to do something as a group that none of us was able to do on our own, and namely to stay sober and happy at the same time. And I'm one who believes that this is an essential ingredient in long-term sobriety, and if you're in AA and you're not happy, you're doing it wrong. It's that simple, and it puts it on your back to figure that out and to get a handle on this program uh, so that the power of it can come in, because it's real hard to stay miserable and sober for a long time. Eventually, it just runs out, and we're in the next 45 minutes, we're we're going to try and get through three steps. This um, opportunity is particularly welcome to me, I feel um, that in sharing about the 12 steps is something I can do with a lot of enthusiasm. I do it with the hopes there's some new people here that will um, find something useful out of it. Um, Before I get rolling on that, I always like to point out that um, in the program, if someone is uh, sharing on the steps or their story, whatever it might be, that there isn't anybody who is the ultimate expert on anything in AA. We're just one drunk sharing with another one, and if something that uh, you hear uh, is confusing or it doesn't seem like it's acceptable, why maybe I said it wrong, maybe you heard it wrong, we urge you to um, talk to us or talk to your sponsor. Uh, The program and these principles are designed uh, to be quite flexible, to give us some elbow room, especially in the beginning, uh, it was a program that was put together by drunks, for drunks. It was not developed by college professors. And uh, the early drunks knew themselves very well, and they knew that this thing was structured in a way that said, uh, you will do this, there would be nobody at the meetings. I mean, it's just that simple. that You tell a drunk that he has to do something, and he does just the opposite. That's just the nature when we first arrive here. So it's very... Interesting, if you look at the 12 steps, you'll see that uh, you're not in them if you're brand new and you're just hearing about them for the first time. Your name isn't mentioned or anything, thou shalt do this. Uh, it's all a report of action taken by the people who came before you, and it is presented uh, in a manner that you can see the results first. And so it is um, doesn't require as big a leap of faith as one might think. This program uh, recently celebrated uh, its 50th anniversary and was started by two guys from Vermont who ended up in Akron, Ohio. And one of them was a physician and one of them was a stockbroker. And both of them had been um, exposed to a thing called the Oxford Group, which was something that preceded Alcoholics Anonymous, where people not Alcoholics, just regular people, were getting together in an attempt to simply try and become better people. Um, I put, take my hat off to the human beings in the world like that. I am astounded that it exists. I can't, uh, I, I just don't seem to make progress until I feel the heat. <laughs> Obviously, there's some people of higher character who do it through choice. Very interesting proposition, but we don't find that many here. Um, But out of this came the guidelines and principles that were incorporated into Alcoholics Anonymous. And I mention that because the uh, steps are really a group of principles uh, as the forward to the 12 and 12 says, which are uh, spiritual in nature, and if we practice them as a way of life, they'll do two things. They'll get rid of the obsession to drink, and they'll enable uh, the suffering alcoholic to become happily and usefully whole, which is an interesting goal, happily and usefully whole. Um, These principles have uh, been borrowed from 
religions and philosophies and medicine and have been around for as long as man has found uh, some um, mechanism of dealing with life on a spiritual basis. And so there really isn't anything in the 12 steps that is new. Uh, what's new is who is presenting it and the manner in which it is presented. And it came through the trial and error of the early days. And as uh, we find out, much of it was borrowed um, from existing history. Unfortunately, the, uh, in the Oxford group, it was working well for the alcoholics because it's very difficult to practice spiritual principles and drink. This was the uh, main dilemma that they seemed to have. Uh, there was great sincerity, especially on Dr. Bob's part in the uh, group out in Akron. I mean, they we're talking about trying this over a period of a couple of years. And his wife and there's some wonderful neighbors and they're there and they're meeting, sort of similar to an AA meeting. And they're talking about uh, the higher power and certain spiritual principles. And then you go home and drink. And it just they just don't mix well together. And uh, it very often we find in the early days in the program, we'll find people who are trying to find an easier, softer way. And it, I remember it occurring to me, gee, if I could work the steps while drinking <laughs> until I have a spiritual awakening, it'd be real easy to quit then because you'd be a new person or whatever happens to you when you have one of those things, whatever that means in the 12th step. Maybe I could get it done that way, but it's uh, you, you realize the problems involved. It's hard to get back out of jail, and it's hard to get back out of nut wards, and there's all these things that interfere with the plan. And so it wasn't working that well for the uh, drunks in the Oxford group, but it was working um, for in human beings' lives, and it did work in a friend of uh, Bill's. And I just would talk about this little story as a lead into the um, program as a whole. Back in uh, 1934, Bill, our stockbroker co-founder, had reached the absolute bottom. He had lost a fortune that he had made on Wall Street and was uh, basically unemployed, had been hospitalized a number of times. His wife was now working and he was borrowing money out of her pocketbook in order to go to the bar to get the creative thoughts generated in your head so that you can then amass a fortune and put the money back in the pocketbook. You remember that train of thought. And, and it was uh, on one of those Saturday mornings that she had gone off to work and he had pulled out his hidden bottle of gin to settle into some serious creative thinking when the phone rang and his old drinking buddy, Ebby, was, wanted to come by and see him and he was all excited about this visit. He hadn't seen him in a while. But he was disturbed with one thing, and it was that Ebby was sober, and it had Bill quite upset and nervous. When your drinking buddy is sober and sounds good, you know something is wrong. You know what I'm talking about. And when he arrived at the uh, kitchen table, Bill saw there was many things wrong. He looked good, he was healthy, he was smiling, his eyes were clear, and the first words out of his mouth were, Bill, I've got religion. And uh, this has to be the lowest moment that you can imagine. When you're sitting there with your bottle of gin and your old friend is showing up and uh, he looks good and he starts talking about having religion. And uh, this was very disconcerting. But he was quite persuasive about this Oxford group that uh, he had been involved in. And he got carrying on with Bill into sort of a discussion and it was at that point in time that um, Bill expressed his hostility to the idea of a higher power. He had been in, uh, involved in church as a child and had thought it all through and had dismissed it as just being something that wasn't going to work in his life. There was too much dogma. It was too uh, restricted and it was too confusing. And besides, it was, just didn't work. And um, during this discussion, Abby came up with the idea which he presented to Bill, why don't you choose your own concept of God? The, the wonderful thing, and of course you see that has been adopted into Alcoholics Anonymous, the one thing that is beautiful about that is it's hard to argue against it. <laughs> it really takes everything away from you. You've got all that hostility to the thing, and you go, well, you just come up with whatever you want. 
then you, it's hard to go, that's not acceptable. You know what I mean? And so it just catches you off guard, and you suddenly have to open your mind up a little bit, which is what, and it stuck with Bill, and during his next hospitalization, obviously he didn't stay sober or anything, it just stuck with him as an idea. <laughs> And during his next hospitalization, uh, in the recovery process, why he did cry out uh, for a higher power to help him and had a rather pronounced uh, spiritual phenomenon occur to him that uh, certainly doesn't occur to the vast majority of people. Most of us have the garden variety change that takes place in our sobriety, but in Bill's case, it was one of these singular events where in the matter of a few minutes, he had experienced a great freedom from alcohol and a great sense of hope about the future. He essentially went from a very bleak outlook all in the matter of a few moments into um, a great expectation about the future and the freedom from alcohol and a realization that he had come close to his higher power and really experienced something in great depth. And the wonderful thing, we owe a great debt of gratitude to the psychiatric profession at this moment in time because you've got to realize we're in the uh, lockup place and you call the psychiatrist to describe what just happened. <laughs> and uh, there was a wonderful chance that the uh, doctor could have said, oh, forget it, man, that was just a DT's. And that may have been uh, a great detour in the origin of AA had that happened, but Dr. Silkworth was not um, a person like that, and uh, he was quite familiar with spiritual principles and, uh, and the spirituality that it can be used in recovery, and he did not dismiss it, but rather encourage Bill to take advantage of it and explain that these events do happen to human beings and that it does change their lives significantly and that he should mark it as a great moment of hope, and which Bill did. And he went forth from that day and never had another drink and charged out with the enthusiasm of someone who had something like that to sober up the world. And we still see that in AA. In the early months, uh, many of us go racing off to the bars of our friends with the good news that they don't have to suffer anymore. Joe, put down the beer. You don't have to suffer anymore. <laughs> and Joe says, I'm not suffering. Go away. <laughs> but we all know that uh, great message carrying that you have and uh, I, you know you just got it I can't believe it's possible to get up in the morning and not puke and go to work and, and I've been to work 11 days in a row and you tell people at work I've been here 11 days in a row and someone says I've been here for 11,000 days in a row hardly a record and uh, we soon learn that uh, we're excited about doing things that people have been doing for uh, forever you know we just uh, have latched on to a little bit of life for the first time and so this enthusiasm led Bill out into uh, all over the place telling people about sobriety and how wonderful it was and he's now got three months and going around sharing this message and you've got to realize the message was kind of who put you off a little bit when you come up and go, let me tell you, I was sitting there and all of a sudden a bright light came into my room and I heard the wind blowing and I felt like I was on a mountaintop. And the guy says back to him, that happens when I drink rum. <laughs> if our program was built on that, we just would still be getting off the ground, but that's the only experience that Bill had to share and so he was desperately trying to share this going around out of great generosity, sharing this good feeling with people and getting no one sober, but he still had, his heart was in the right place, and he was simultaneously putting together uh, a business deal with a machine tool company in Akron, Ohio, that made various machines for the rubber processing, and if he could get this proxy deal put together, he would end up being the president of this new company, and that would be appropriate for an alcoholic who's been all the way down is to make a full recovery back to a millionaire in six months. Only, right, why waste time? Let's get there in a hurry. And so our co-founder certainly had the same impatience that many of us have. Well, I'm not going to get everything back fast. And out he went to Akron. And we all know the story that uh, the deal fell through and the, his business associates came back to New York and he was left there for another couple of days to wrap things up and alone in the Mayflower Hotel, and it occurred to him that life 
just wasn't quite right. And how could this happen to him? He tried so hard, not drinking anymore, being a good guy, and look at this terrible deal. And he stood in the lobby of the Mayflower and heard the piano music coming out of the bar and heard all the laughter in there and just said, you know, I could go in, cheer myself up a little bit, and then go back to New York. And it uh, suddenly it dawned on him that that would probably mean absolute death and back to the insane asylums. And his eyes went to the other side of the lobby, and he saw a list of church directories. And it was out of a sense of desperation that he got the names of some ministers off of that list and called them in order to find a drunk that he could go talk to so that he could stay sober. It wasn't anyone giving anything away, because i got to go work with somebody for my own sobriety. And the um, minister, Reverend Tunk, led him to Henrietta Cyberling of the Cyberling um, millionaires and she was a member of the oxford group and she said do i have a drunk for you yes i do know someone he is a uh and it was dr bob who little did dr bob know that he was about to have a 12-step call played played on him and henrietta called up dr bob's wife ann and said good news there's a man in town from new york who knows all about staying sober and i just know that if we get dr bob together with him that all will be well. So let's set up a meeting right now. And Ann said, I'm sorry, I don't, I agree with you. We gotta have the meeting, but we'll be unable to hold it today because tomorrow is Mother's Day and Dr. Bob went out to buy me a Mother's Day present and he just came home with a potted plant and he and the plant are under the table right now. <laughs> And neither one of them is moving. <laughs> and so, it looks like the meeting will have to be tomorrow. So now we got our co-founder, Dr. Bob, well-known Akron surgeon, lying under the table. And when he wakes up with his hangover, he is greeted with the wonderful news from his wife that there's a guy from New York who knows all about staying sober and they're going to meet with him. You remember how we just got led around, you're going to meet with this and that, and, and Dr. Bob said on the way over, I'll give him 15 minutes, you know, the famous last words. And they met in the uh, gatehouse of the Cyberling Estate and the meeting lasted for five hours. There was that instant chemistry between two people who suddenly realized that they desperately needed each other, that they, together they could do something that um, was, they just knew they were on to something. And that was the origins of this fellowship of AA. And it was trial and error as it grew in the early days and years. Uh, Dr. Bob was quite distinguishing for a number of reasons. And I suppose the first thing he did was to have AA's first slip. And uh, he did that about five or six weeks sobriety. He suddenly realized as so many new people, I've had pigeons who do this, in about six weeks of sobriety, they suddenly go, I've neglected my education all these years, and I'm taking off this weekend for a seminar on economics in Las Vegas. <laughs> anyway, Dr. Bob went off to a medical convention in Atlantic City. <laughs> and uh, came back drunk and had to perform an operation the next morning and Bill worked with him all night trying to get him his hand steady enough and as the story goes uh, they gave him a bottle of beer a half hour before the operation to keep his hand steady and he went in performed the surgery and that was his last drink and uh, so bad that AA got started back in 1935 and here we are 50 years later um, with a million and a half people in over a hundred countries and the basic ingredient in all of this uh, success is the 12 steps. These 12 steps are what individual AA members all over the world end up using as a way of life. It seems that most of us with our alcoholism missed out on life 101. You know what I mean? We know a lot of things but we just don't have a handle on how you just sort of get through a day, you know, one of those basic things. And since you're, you know, we get here and we're 25, 35, 45, 55, 65, whatever age we get here, it's real hard to own up to the fact we haven't figured it out yet. 
and we just pretend everything's fine and that we know certain things. But deep down inside, we are filled with resentments and anger and self-pity and fear and anxiety and confusion, and none of it makes any sense. It never has. We have a very cynical look at the world. We don't really trust people. We're not too excited about the future. We'd rather forget about the past. And there isn't too many comfortable places we can park. And we're always on the move. You know, just keep moving. I'm here, and it's not comfortable here. I'll sit over there. It's not comfortable there. I'll go to a movie. I don't like the movie. And everywhere we go, we're there. That's our problem. <laughs> when we first get here and just learn about alcoholism and learn that we're powerless over alcohol and we encounter our first step, we're apt to be given the wrong impression that the mere knowledge of our situation will carry us through. And in the writings of the um, AA literature, Bill mentions this many, many times. If it's, uh, he probably mentions this as much as anything, is that self-knowledge avails us nothing. In other words, it serves no purpose to know that we're an alcoholic and to learn about alcoholism as a disease and it does this and it does that. If that's all we had to rely on, we would then have what we call an educated drunk. We have someone who is lying on the floor, drunk, but knows exactly why. Whereas, whereas before, we were lying there wondering why. I wonder what the problem is. Now we lie there, same, just as drunk as ever, and we know exactly why we're there. Well, I'm here, I'm an alcoholic. I have this thing and I have that, but it doesn't help in sobriety, knowing that with us, that has no bearing on it because that's not our problem. Our problem is not ignorance of alcoholism. If that's all it was, we would just go take a crash course at Rutgers or someplace, walk out with a PhD in alcoholism and never drink again. But our problem is uh, phrased well in the first step. It says we're powerless over alcohol. So the only answer to the being powerless is power. We have to somehow get the resources, the wherewithal to stay sober. And it can't be done on our own. And so it is something that we get out of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous. And so it is very important to come to grips with that in our first step. There seems to, Big Book talks about there's no defense against the first drink. Uh, Bill writes about we don't have the same kind of defense that you have when you, to the, when you go to put your hand on a hot stove. In other words, it's almost as if the mechanism, you don't really think about that. You're walking in there and your hand wanders near the gas burner as you're doing this, and it comes back all by itself. You know how that whole process, ah, whoo, wow, and then you look over, hey, stove is on. You don't go like this, I smell something burning. <laughs> hey, I wonder if I left the gas on. You know, in the meanwhile, the hand is melted off, you know, as we sit here and debate the issue, am I really powerless over a fire? <laughs> It just boom. And uh, so we have the same thing. We have all this knowledge. We have all this internalization of what our drinking did to us. Every time we drink, we go to jail. Every time this happens, if I drink again, the doctor told me my liver, I'll probably have a convulsion. I'll do that. I'll do that. And then this will probably, oh, I, I just had a drink. It was like, it just came in. We had no defense against it. All of a sudden, the thought to have a drink found its way into our computer, and it was immediately followed by a drink. And then when we're asked later, how did that happen? We're at a loss to explain it. We just seem to part company. And our track record goes on and on and on where um, it is proven to us there is no way that we're not going to eventually take that first drink again. And this obsession to continually think about drinking stays with us. And the common denominator that we all have is we're unable to solve this dilemma on our own. So our first step of AA really takes us down this path of surrender, and uh, we strongly suggest anybody who is new that you spend time on this and realize what 100% powerless means. The more you can come to grips with being totally, absolutely hopeless case, the happier your sobriety will be. It is one of our first paradoxes that total surrender will enable you to win. Because if we don't surrender to the first step totally, then the remaining steps are optional. 
You know what I mean? They're out there as things that we might want to engage in at some time, as opposed to this is what can get us out of this situation that the first step and surrendering in the first step did. Um, I like to compare the transition from the first step to the second step because I used to fly with thinking about jumping out of a plane without a parachute. There's a certain feeling of control you have if you're dropping from 20,000 down to 500. You know what I mean? You see these free fallers and they can do figure eights and you just can really be free as a bird. But at the last moment, as the ground is coming up, it's very comforting to realize you have a parachute. It's sort of a very important feature of the trip, uh, is to have that. <laughs> and if you were to picture uh, how you would feel as you watch the... when the See, from way up high, the relative motion, you don't pick up on it, and it just seems like it may take forever to get down. But as close as you get, it just zoom, it starts moving up real fast. And uh, it's right then, when you go to grab the cord, you go, oh my God, the whole thing is gone. Uh, that you may have a sense of what the first step is all about, what being <laughs> powerless over alcohol is. And we, if we could work it somehow, we would take everybody in who's brand new to AA and go up on top of a parachute tower and throw everybody off without a chute. Just get that feeling of uh, <laughs> powerlessness. And about ten feet from the ground, a hidden hand would shoot out and grab you at the last second, right before you hit it. And we'd have a little voice that said, excuse me, we're, we're conducting a survey. Do you believe in God? And, uh, that's the only way to move from step one to step two. If you do step one right, then step two becomes very appealing. We came to believe that a power greater than ourselves could restore us to sanity we would come to believe that there has to be a higher power because of the nature of the situation I'm in. You see what I mean? It removes all the debate over the issue. And if there's anything the second step is, it is a huge debate over the existence of a higher power for you. And all human beings seem to engage in this. And um, we are hardly the exception. The typical... A uh, person who arrives in AA has become an agnostic, if not, I mean, has become a, an agnostic, if not an atheist. And the question of coming to believe in a higher power brings out some great negative reactions in us. It hurts us right down to our gut as we start going, I don't mind admitting defeat, but you don't have to hit me with this God stuff just because I'm down. I mean, it just feels awful. And we are confronted with uh, what I call the Jack Benny choice in the uh, big book where Bill writes a very interesting sentence in there where he says, um, to die an alcoholic, interesting sentence in there where he says, um, to die an alcoholic death or to live on a spiritual basis is not always an easy choice to make. <laughs> and only us drunks would relate to that. We're just going, okay, sir, we'd like you get your choice. Which would you care to choose? You can die an alcoholic death. Let me show you what it looks like. Here's a nut ward. Here's a guy in the final stages. Here's advanced liver disease. Oh, God, that's awful. You know what I mean? We get a full briefing on an alcoholic. You get that. Or you could live on a spiritual basis. How long would it take to get that kind of thing? Hmm. Boy, that, this is going to be rough. I mean, we're all back over here into the alcoholic death. We're going, well, maybe I'm the exception to this. Maybe I'm doing that. There's such an aversion to whatever this uh, living on a spiritual basis, whatever the transition to uh, higher power is, that um, there's tremendous reluctance to consider doing it. Um, it is at this point that we can look at AA itself, that we can look at the record of the program, that we can realize that it is a result-oriented, that we're not making a choice on the basis of theory, that one meeting after another we have people standing up in front who are examples of what these principles can do, and um, 
we see graphic examples of ourselves compared to Alcoholics Anonymous. It's in the middle of this debate, a typical sponsor, if you have the kind of sponsor that I had, will not discuss theory with you. They will simply point out that you are wearing a wristband from a nut ward, and this person who's doing the step has his own car. That'll be the basic uh, PhD level discussion. Uh, and I know you're, you want to get into some debate about religion, and they keep pointing to your wristband. And it comes down in its absolute simplicity at this point in the program to where someone is going to say, the reason you should try the 12 steps is because your way stinks. And so this keeps it very simple. Uh, Dr. Bob was very big in this. Keeping it simple came from him. And it is your way stinks. Your way doesn't work. You are the product of your whole game plan for living. And in the past, you were, you were thinking, well, it needs slight modification. Remember that? That was a slight little thing of fine-tuning, fine-tuning. I need a better lawyer so I get out of jail sooner. You know, that's, that's the, where we were thinking, you know, that kind of a thing. Let's see. Maybe I could find a way to puke painlessly. You know, that, this is the type of thinking we could come up with. Well, if I could have convulsions, and maybe there's a pill, so you don't feel convulsions. Maybe there's this, you know, but no way were we into, I'm not going to drink and try a spiritual program. That just was totally unacceptable because we didn't fit in that mold. And we came from all different backgrounds approaching this second step. We came um, in here and felt threatened by the AA way of life. We came in here with the uh, preconceived idea that we had already tried that that we had tried the um, way of faith and it didn't work when we were seven. And uh, so that's out. No sense trying it now that I'm 64. And uh, we realized that that was probably a very childish attempt, that we weren't really serious about it. Uh, maybe we came in here intellectually self-sufficient. We felt a little bit superior. We had this feeling of intellectual self-sufficiency that... Um, we had a little secret that we didn't even share here in Alcoholics Anonymous, and that was that we were born gifted. We have a little extra thing that a lot of people don't have, um, but we also have humility, and so we don't tell people about it. We don't embarrass them by constantly reminding them they're in the presence of greatness. And, uh, we used to go to low-class bars and drink in there just to let them osmosis, what it feels like to be around greatness, even though they probably wouldn't appreciate it. And we often sat alone and made little circles on the bar with our glass of beer, wondering why nobody appreciated the fact we were there. That, those sort of wonderful secret thoughts will cause us great dilemmas in uh, coming to believe that a power greater than ourselves can restore us to sanity. We may also um, find ourselves part way totally bigoted about the idea of a spiritual way of life. We're just uh, not even interested in it. We find that religions and all of that are just a bunch of hypocrites, and we remember back to the days we sat on our front porch on Sunday morning with our beer belly hanging out in a spotted T-shirt and a 16-ounce Budweiser and our sunglasses, and we burp a couple times and watch the people go into church and go, look at those hypocrites going into that church. There's a banker going in there. That guy rips people off every day. There's a lawyer going in there. That guy's ripping off. You know, in other words, we just specialize in taking everybody else's inventory except our own and had that feeling, you know, like that isn't it. This is out and this is out. Or we may have even been in the category where we were in that crowd. We were up there every Sunday morning. We went down there, went to our church, took a pledge afterwards, and then got drunk. And people are going, God, I just don't think for this man or woman that this uh, concept can work at all. And as we come in, we find that all of them had their fall, all of these uh, various backgrounds had their shortcomings, that the guy who was uh, full of faith and reeking of alcohol uh, wasn't even serious about it. The last thing he really wanted was for the pledge to work. And it was the first time here in sobriety that we're able uh, to look at all of these various backgrounds that we arrive here with and see them for what they really are and come to realize that maybe 
we can start out by just having uh, the program take over our drinking problem. And that gets us into the third step where we made a decision to turn our will and our lives over the care of God as we understood him. And it is willingness will get us a beginning. Oh, this idea of turning one's life over may sound very esoteric and intellectual, but boiled down is a rather simple um, discussion. Our problem had been self-centeredness. And what this step is designed to do is to get us unself-centered. That's the whole process. We, as self-centered people, were, as Bill writes in the big book, like the actor ever trying to rearrange everybody on the stage. In our own head, we had a vision of how the day ought to go. And we saw Cousin Susie doing this. And we saw our daughters and sons over here dressed this way. Then they all do that. And then if these people come in, then I come in. And then this is how the deal goes. And God, what a happy ending. We even put a happy ending into this thing. So then we walk out and then nobody's where they're supposed to be. Nobody has even read our script. Nobody has the vaguest idea. And so we try even harder to control the situation and to manage it. And we just have no uh, concept of what the problem is. And we learn um, that perhaps we ought to be kind. Maybe that's it. We're going to have to be nicer to people. And so we go up and we find when a self-centered person can only act kind, there is no way that they can be kind. And so even when we're acting kind, we're doing it for selfish reasons. We go, you know, if I could get the reputation as a kind person, people would like me. If I could get the reputation as an honest person, people would do business with me. But we aren't really honest, or we aren't really kind, or we have no idea of what love is, because all we're doing is acting it. We're just going, oh, that's what it looks like when you love your children. You smile nicely at them, and you touch them every so often, and you show up at their birthdays. But there is, when self-centeredness is uh, involved, there's a very painful realization that we're trying to get something out of the birthday. That we always have to be the recipient. And this problem, this painful perspective on life, is the problem of the alcohol. This is the classic that we arrive here. Is we are painfully aware uh, that it's warm in here. We're painfully aware of all kinds of things and don't seem to be able to stop focusing on that. We don't seem to be able to stop doing that. And that is the problem of self-centeredness. And so the third step of AA is the technique that is used in getting rid of self-centeredness. It is making a decision to become God-centered. To become God-centered. In order to do this, we suddenly realize several things. Number one, I'm not in charge of writing the script. Well, if I'm not in charge of writing the script, who writes the script? In other words, unless there's a higher power, there's no such thing as a master script. There is no such thing as the master uh, orchestrator who has put together the musical score that we are all playing, and if we're all following the same music, we can play in harmony. But unless I concede that there is such a thing as a higher power, there's no such thing as all these other things for us to be part of. And that was the problem of being self-centered. Everybody doing their own thing. i got to keep all my options open. All of these philosophies that sound so great in the saying. I remember hearing that. got to keep your options open. A fantastic, it was very appealing to a drinker. Because that means you should stay at a bar and drink and never move. But then your options are all open. You don't have a job. You're not supposed to be anywhere. You're totally free to go in any direction, any opportunity that comes along. But as soon as somebody says, if you like, I'm down here and dig ditches, and you're down there digging, all the other options are closed because you're digging down there. So keep them open. You've got to just stay there and drink and be available. And I like that. The problem is you run out of money, and they won't serve you anymore. And you have to. So in other words, in order to uh, not be that way. I, in order to keep my options open, I can't move. Um, in order to do my own thing, I'm in conflict with everybody else who apparently is doing their own thing. It was a revolutionary concept for me, I don't know about you all, to even concede that there was a whole bunch of other people who were out there focusing in on something bigger than themselves, and that's why they were in harmony. 
That's what led to all of the harmony and sobriety, was to concede that there was something, and here was the bottom line, that there was such a thing as the right thing to do. And sobriety ended up consisting of an endless series of doing the next right thing. But in order for that to be possible, there has to be a higher power. And the mechanism of finding out what the next right thing is, is the process of the 12 steps. The process of getting rid of self-centeredness and intuitively starting to be communicated to as to what the next right thing is. And we start talking about unself-centered terms. We start seeing prayers that say, I pray I may be useful. And that was never a word in a self-centered person's vocabulary. You just didn't go, okay, I think I want the name be useful. It just didn't occur. You went out, I'm going to go out and get them. I'm going to go out and climb over them. But being useful never seemed to be the driving, motivating force. So as we get in the program, uh, we start coming across more spiritual terms. And so this particular step is an action step. It begins with willingness. And it may begin by starting out, turning our drinking problem over to our AA group and to our sponsor, and we see the results we get out of that. And then we realize that our sobriety, what if we're going to spend the next 50 years, however long we're going to live, hopefully, is going to consist of turning over as much as we can discover in the same sense that we turned over our drinking problem. And in order to do that, we have a whole remaining nine steps where we inventory, find out what these things are. And so the um, third step in the 12 and 12, and we'll wrap this up right now, brings an interesting concept in called willpower. And I always like to talk about willpower because you hear it saying there's no way that willpower uh, has anything to do with sobriety. And that is an absolutely true and false statement. <laughs> um, it's true in the sense that there's no way an alcoholic can stay sober just on willpower. There's no way you can just take your willpower and go out there and say, I am going through my own resources to not drink and stay sober. We may be able to do it for a certain amount of time. How Each person has a different amount of willpower. I have about two days' worth. Uh, other people, I've seen them clench their teeth and go for a whole damn year. I'm not drinking, I'm not drinking, and all of a sudden, they go, you know, it's like, who can hold their breath longest underwater, you know, and some of these people can do it for eight minutes or something like that, and I'm good for 15, 20 seconds, and so there's a great variety in the amount uh, that can be done on our own, but eventually, everything, is, the one thing we all have in common, eventually you run out, and when you run out, that's the end, and so in that sense, you can't possibly stay sober on willpower, and yet, the, the steps and the program are all done through our willpower. It is our power and our choice that gets us in the car, that gets us to the meeting. It is our uh, willpower choice. It's us, ourselves, that goes and buys the 12 and 12 and goes home and works on it and gets a pencil and a piece of paper and does an inventory and physically does the steps. And so as Bill, what Bill writes about is we want to get our willpower in harmony with that of a higher power. And when that is done, we have suddenly are using our cells to go over and turn on the electricity instead of trying to produce the light ourselves. We learn all of this power that is available to us if we're willing to use it. And as we find in the remaining steps, there's a lot of pride, ego that stands in the way of asking for help. Alcoholics do not specialize in asking for help. We are very independent people, and we go, yes, I agree, help is available. I know if I call my sponsor, I will get the help, but I prefer to handle this alone. <laughs> and then they pick us up one more time and carry us off, and sobriety and the remaining steps is the process by which we learn how to bring uh, all of this help and power into our lives. Uh, we're at the end of the time. I would remind everybody we have another meeting uh, in 15 minutes for anybody who would like to come in for a discussion meeting. And it's customary to wrap this meeting up with the Lord's Prayer for anybody who would care to join in.
Thank you for listening. I hope you enjoyed the podcast. Sobercast is ad-free, and we'd like your help in order to keep it that way. So if you'd like to help us be self-supporting by pledging a dollar to a month, visit Sobercast.com and look for the donate links. Thank you very much.